Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of March 25th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss our take on the House Finance Committee's draft budget. Second, we explain why we believe the Regulatory Commission of Alaska and the Department of Natural Resources have frontline responsibility for dealing with the Cook Inlet situation and that the legislature should only get involved after those two agencies have scoped the problem. And third, we explain why, if anyone has too much power under the Constitution on fiscal matters, It is the legislature, not the executive. And now, let's join Michael. You're going to start me off today, and we're going to talk about the draft House Finance Committee bill uh, for budgets. And uh, give me, give me your, give me your thoughts here. Let's uh, let's get the rundown rolling here. Well, this budget really has has made me focus on something that I've sort of known all along and we've talked about in various ways all along, but it sort of brought it head first. And, and there's a, a op-ed that I read that was in the ADN uh, that sort of goes along that same line, sort of makes me realize what's really going on here. The op-ed was uh, uh, from about a week ago, actually. Uh, it says, when it comes to state investments, do PFDs provide enough return? And here's here's sort of the realization that that I, I come to from time to time. There are two ways to look at the PFD. One is as a spending category. And that's how the legislature has looked at it since 2017. And they look at it as sort of the, the leftover or sort of the marginal source of, or the marginal spend and compare all of the other uh, spending categories to it uh, when they decide on what the PFD amount is going to be. And it's, and it's, and it's because, and, and the PFD is just always at, at risk in that environment, looking at it that way, because the PFD doesn't have a lobby group behind it on the ground in Juneau going from office right. to office saying, right. saying, you know, our, the, the return on this is great. It's better than other things. Whereas other things like education or um, the university or other categories of spending do have lobbying troops on the ground uh, uh, paid, <laughs> ironically enough, by the legislature through the, through the appropriations to these different groups. Uh, lobbying groups on the ground paid to go from office to office and say, hey, look at our thing. It's a lot better than that PFD thing. And so you, you end up with a situation where, you know, the PFD is always sort of last and it always takes it in the chin with whatever is whatever the other lobby or the, the lobbying groups are out there pushing. You can see that in this budget. I mean, Delana has put forward a budget, Delana Johnson, Valley Representative Delana Johnson, so-called conservative rep, <laughs> Delana Johnson, has put forward a budget that that spends a lot on other things. And when you get to the PFD, 
it is a 3070 PFD. We used to be, you know, at a statutory PFD. And then for a while, the house was at a 50 50 PFD. Right. Now they're down to a 3070 PFD, which I suppose they claim is better than the sentence by 5%. So, but, but that's, that's one way to look at the PFD. That's not the way that all of the economic analyses that we've seen over the years have looked at the PFD. They look at the PFD as a source of funding, PFD cuts as a source of funding, and compare those PFD cuts to other potential sources of revenue and say, look, if you're going to use PF, if you use PFD cuts, they have the largest adverse impact on the overall economy compared to those other alternatives. And they are by far, I'm quoting ICER studies now, by far the costliest to Alaska families uh, of all of those other sources of funding. And when you look at the PF, PFD cuts as a source of funding, it the PFD is, is, is certainly the preferable use of funds. And, and if you need additional funds, if you have a deficit and you need additional funds, one of those other sources of funds, oil taxes, uh, flat tax, sales tax, uh, on down the line, one of those or other sources of funding is, is much the better way to do it. The legislature has always looked at it the first way. They've always looked at it as a spending category and always compared it to the other spending categories and always put it last because, in part, the PFD doesn't have troops on the ground, doesn't have you know feet on the ground in Juneau pushing their point of view. But when the economists look at it, they've always looked at it the other way and said, look, we shouldn't be cutting PFDs. We should be using one of these other sources of revenue, which have a far lower impact on the Alaska economy, bring in revenues from non-residents, which PFD cuts don't do, and reduce the impact on Alaska families and on the Alaska economy as a result of bringing in revenues from, from other locations. And, and from an economic perspective, you ought to be using one of those other, one of those other options. The legislature's never, ever, ever looked at it that way. They've always looked at it the first way uh, because they don't want to, they don't want to have to look at taxes. They don't want to have to look at other sources of revenue. They, even though they're not going to cut the budget enough to, to pay a full PFD, they don't want to look at alternatives for filling the filling uh, filling those deficits, and it's it's frustrating when you when you get into a discussion about the PFD. It's very frustrating to me when you get into a discussion about the PFD that you have all these people who suddenly run to that side of the boat and say it's a spending category. It's a spending category, and look at it compared to other all these other alternatives that we have. You know these paid lobbyists down there, the legislature's paid lobbyists right. down there you know, pushing, it's a spending category, it's a spending category. And, and, you know, and, and we can't spend on that if we've got to spend, if we need to be spending on other things, as opposed to, as opposed to looking at it the way the economists do and say, no, no, it's a revenue category. PFD cuts are revenue. And, and here's all of the other revenue sources you, you could be pursuing that would have a far lower impact on the Alaska economy and a far lower impact on uh, on Alaska, uh, on Alaska families, and it's just frustrating. It, it, these discussions are always frustrating, and this this budget cycle is going to be another uh, is going to be frustrating again, because the legislature is going to be talking, if you will, in one language. PFD is spending, and I and others are going to be looking at it in another language. PFD cuts as revenues, and we're going to be saying you are choosing the absolute worst possible of all the alternatives you're choosing the absolute worst alternative for how to close these budget deficits you're hurting alaska families you're hurting the overall alaska economy and they're they're not they're not going to engage they're not going to discuss that issue they're not going to we're not going yeah, to have we, a discussion yeah. on that issue you can't even have a you can't even have a good rational argument or debate with somebody if you can't if you can't agree on the foundational principles of the debate and that's where we're at, they see a potato, we see a tomato and that's, and that's, you can't even have a real argument with people. Um, I've had arguments with people who, who believe that the PFD is 
like you said, the welfare, the 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 state spending and everything. They don't believe it's the people's money. You can't have the argument with you if you can't even agree on the foundational on the foundational component of the discussion. And I mean, this is a fairly new problem. This is a problem that's only been here the last eight years. Right. I mean, since 2016, this is the it's only been here eight years before that. It was a pass through. It was never a state spending category. It just went through. And so this is a fairly new and recent development. But it's it's like we've totally lost that battle in that regard. Yeah. And Hammond looked. I mean, Hammond looked at it as as PFD cuts the spending, because he said, look, if you get to the point where you you've used the other half. For government for government spending, and that's still not enough. You're still running deficits. Then you then you should be using taxes. I mean, he understood that that you shouldn't that that PFD cuts using PFD cuts as a way of, of filling the deficit was wrong economically. Was hard on the Alaska economy. Was was hard on Alaska families. And so he talked about it in terms of taxes. But none of these none of these none, none of these legislators want to do it do it that way. And, and I, and I go back to a, a column I wrote a few weeks ago, a couple, I go back to a couple of things. One, a column I wrote a couple of weeks ago, which is now that they've passed, particularly now that they've passed the legislative salary increases, all of the legislatures, legislators are in the top 20%. And so they're not viewing PFD cuts in the same way as it affects the other 80% of Alaska families. They're viewing PFD cuts as their cheapest way out to them personally, to they and their families and to their donors, the cheapest way out of filling the budget gaps. And, and they say to themselves, well, we don't have to say no to any of these lobbyists that are walking the hall. We can say yes to all these lobbyists that are walking the hall. Um, and, and we can fill the budget gap in a way that really doesn't affect me much personally. Um, that's that's one. And the other is we've got a governor. I mean, I don't want to leave him out of this. We've got a governor who occasionally dips in and says, like he did last spring, well, you know, what we ought to be targeting is the thing that has the lowest, the, the broadest, Im the, the broadest impact, the lowest impact on any one segment of the Alaska economy, the, the, the lowest impact on Alaska families. And so he said at the time, I'm going to propose a sales tax. And then he forgets he says that. <laughs> and, and he goes back to saying no taxes. Um, and so you've got, you've just got a situation in Juneau I, that, that, that is, just, is just off on this tangent about PFDs are spending. And so we're going to compare them to all the other spending. And because they don't have lobbyists, because PFDs don't have lobbyists that walk in our office and give us all these charts and graphs about how, how good they are. Um, you know, they're the, they're the last on the, they're the last on the list. We got to, we got to satisfy right. the lobbyists for all the other things before we get there. Well, surprisingly, uh, you know, up to eight years ago, nobody would have ever considered that viewpoint because they thought that the electorate would come out them with pitchforks and torches and knives and axes. And after Walker did it, it really didn't happen. There wasn't as much, I mean, I was shocked. I was shocked that the pushback was not, vociferous and that the Senate didn't stand up to that veto and try and override it and everything else. And, and people kind of went meh, which is unfortunate, but that's uh, kind of where we ended up being when it was all said and done. There was a lot about the PFD, but not a lot about the budget, Brad, what were your thoughts on the overall? Um, I mean, it, it, obviously the PFD plays into what's going on there, but you know, the Senate is going to see that and they are, and they are locked and loaded on this whole to 75 25 that's their fiscal plan don't you dare change it and now we're hearing things like maybe they'll be delaying their uh they'll be delaying the capital budget going over to the house as retribution or what i mean i don't know this could just this is like this is like a pissing match back and forth on this deal uh what what are your what do you think about that part of it anyway well the senate the senate's plan is is twenty five seventy five, but that's only the senate's plan i mean the house hasn't right. passed it the the right. the governor hasn't hasn't adopted it. We'll talk a little bit about a little bit about that in the third segment. But but it, it's the Senate being the bully, right? I mean, it's the Senate saying this: it's our way or the highway. Thank you very much. And if you don't go down our highway, we're going to do all sorts of things to make your life to make your life more miserable. And you know, and and Delena, I yeah, 
you know, 30, 30, 70 isn't all that different from 25, 75 yet. It seems to have triggered the sentence of uh, retribution for, oh my God, oh, yeah. you didn't, you didn't no, pay no. attention to our 25, 75. How dare you don't do what we told you to do, you know, and, the, and the, yesterday I mentioned it yesterday. This is actually the first time that I saw any written or news reporting on the agreement between the House and the Senate in the leadership, where apparently they'd agreed on a timeline to when they were going to finish each bill. You know, they were one, you know, House is going to finish the operating budget, Senate was going to finish the capital budget. And I didn't realize that there was like a written agreement. And now Rob confirmed it yesterday that there was an actual written agreement between the leadership. And now the Senate's breaking that. I mean, how can you negotiate with people? who can't even hold to their word, uh, not simply because there was mechanical or something going on, but obviously in a fit of peak, they decided, how dare you not do what we tell you to do? And we're going to change things. Yeah. I mean, how, how can you ever negotiate or, or work with people like that? You can't. I mean, they don't want to negotiate. They just want you to adopt. They, they just want you to adopt what they're doing. And until, and until the governor, and the, and the House pushed back in some way, the House by not passing what the Senate sends over or the governor just vetoing the whole mess and saying, we're starting over if you can't, if you can't play, if you can't play, you know, according to the rules that even you agreed to until the House and the, and the governor step up to the plate and push back, the Senate's just going to keep doing it. You know, bullies keep bullying in, until they, until somebody until stands you up. Punch them right in the face. That's the only time they stop is when somebody punches them right in the face. That's what needs to, I mean, proverbially, not literally, but that's, I mean, you're right. Somebody needs to stand up to them and say no. And, uh, and you know, they, they just can't keep getting away with it. That's kind of the whole point here. You, you know, Michael, on the budget as a whole, we would be having a far different discussion if, if the marginal source of revenue was some form of broad-based tax, because just imagine if, if, if there was a proposal to increase education spending or a proposal to increase child care or a proposal to increase anything uh, in the house that had to be paid for by additional taxes. Will Stapp, for one, Jesse Sumner, for another, would be saying, oh, no, we can't, we can't burden ourselves with additional taxes to pay for that spending. And we would have a much different look going on at the budget than we do, a much more critical look at these spending categories than we do with PFD cuts, but using PFD cuts as a marginal source of revenue. But we're never going to have that discussion. We're never going to have a good budget discussion about the trade-offs as long as they use the PFD, PFD cuts as the marginal source of revenue, regardless of what impact it has on the Alaska economy and Alaska families. We're never going to have that discussion because it doesn't affect them and it doesn't affect their donors. Let's move on to number two of the weekly uh, top three. And this is the RCA, the, the which is the uh, uh, regulatory, utility, Commi yeah, regulatory, regulatory Commission of Alaska, right, which deals with utilities and right. re regulating utilities in Alaska. And the DNR, the Department of Natural Resources, you argue that they have frontline responsibility on the Cook Inlet situation, and the legislature should only get involved after that. But instead, the legislature is putting this as some kind of front and center issue. Right, uh, right. There you go. So there you go. All right. So there's a there's an article in the Frontiersman written by Tim Bradner this week, uh, yesterday. The headline is NSTAR CEO says Cook Inlet gas shortfall more serious than thought earlier uh, by Tim Bradner for the Frontiersman. And, and Tim's reporting on a speech that John Sims, who's the president of NSTAR, gave to the uh, to the RDC, the Resource Development Council, uh, last week and saying that, you know, we're, we're facing a more serious, uh, Sims is saying NSTAR gas is facing a more serious threat in the cooking lit than we thought. Here's what should be going on. The, the RCA, the Regulatory Commission of Alaska, has responsibility by statute, by law, to, to second guess the utilities, to look over the utilities, to regulate the utilities, to make sure that they provide adequate service. If you have the president of one of the utilities out there, the primary gas utility, saying we have a, a serious shortfall coming up, the RCA the next day should be hauling that president into the in before the RCA and say, okay, what do you mean? Tell us what's going on. Let's define the problem. Let's define the problem we're facing. And and while the RCA is engaged in a series of, of overview hearings with some with 
with the South Central Utilities about what their situation is about gas. They're not doing that. They're not hauling Sims in and saying, you tell us what's going on and you tell us what your plan is. And we, with our statutory responsibility, are going are gonna to define the plan and find a way forward. Separately, the Department of Natural Resources has authority over uh, leases in the Cook Inlet, over production from the Cook Inlet, most, almost all of which is state leases. And the, R and the DNR has the authority to reduce the, the royalty on those leases in order if there's if there's a need for uh, incentives to bring it uh, bring about additional production in fact they have they have they have the very authority to to the large to a large extent they have the very authority the rc or the legislature is considering giving them now the legislature though wants to sort of override the dnr and say we're going to give uh, uh royalty relief to the to the to the leases regardless the dnr's authority is circumscribed by saying you have the authority to give relief to the leases if they need it. And so the DNR can step in there and say, do you need additional royalty relief in order to incentivize additional production? So the RCA has the obligation, has the obligation to regulate these utilities, to look at their supply situation, to make sure they have the, to make sure they're taking the steps necessary to have adequate supply. And the DNR has the authority to to come in to, to leases. And if producers are saying we don't have enough incentive, there isn't enough economic incentive to drill this additional, to develop this additional acreage, the DNR has the authority to give them relief to, to, to provide them with the economics to go ahead and do the, and do the additional development. What's happening is notwithstanding the RCA has this obligation to come in and regulate, come in and control the situation, come in and, 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 ask the, the tell the utilities to tell them what's going on and the dnr has the has the ability to give give relief on the other side to incentivize the producers to produce more notwithstanding that we have these two regulatory authorities we have the legislature back there considering you know massive royalty relief to producers in the cook inlet uh, just sort of you know off the top as a way as their way of incentivizing some response to this this situation and what I'm concerned is going to happen is we're going to give way more relief, way more incentives than are needed in order to, to develop the additional supplies. And what I'm also concerned is we're going to do is we're going to create these subsidies out there for those producers to develop additional supplies, subsidies that are going to cost Alaskans in terms of reduced PFDs, uh, develop these additional subsidies, uh, give them these additional subsidies to develop the supply, even though we may not need it even though they may have developed the additional supplies without, without the subsidies. That's what DNR is supposed to go and assess. If you need additional, additional relief, we have the authority to give it to you, but only to the extent you need the additional relief. They have to delve into it. Well, and I think what you're saying here, uh, just to simplify it for those of us who are, you know, uh, talk to me like I'm five, is essentially the moment that a issue becomes politicized, it, event, it immediately becomes, you know, exponentially more expensive in the long run and usually doesn't reach a satisfactory conclusion. I mean, that's historically, anytime an issue becomes politicized, it immediately becomes vastly more expensive and usually does not, con does not end well in the long run. That's, that's usually what we find out historically. Yeah. I mean, and the, and the early, the, the, the reimbursable credits we gave producers in the Cook Inlet in the early 2000, 20 teens, is a good example of that. We spent a massive amount of money, pumping money, reimbursable credits into Cook Inlet producers, and we didn't get a really good supply response. Um, and so, yes, we we solved this, the issue politically, pumped money at them, the legislature pumped money at them, and, and, it, and it cost a lot of money, and we really didn't solve the problem, as we're finding out now about a, about a decade later. What I think ought to happen is the RCA ought to stand up and say, look, it's our responsibility to get this thing under control to define the issue. NSTAR, come in here and give us your, your, your supply curve. Come in here and tell us what you think your demand is going to be. And let's define what the problem really is, as opposed to you know speeches and explosive headlines. Let's have an on-the-fact record discussion analysis of what the need really is. Is there a shortfall? Where is the shortfall? How much is there? 
That's what the RCA ought to do. The DNR ought to say, okay, we see this shortfall. Cook Inlet gas supply isn't adequate to respond. We see, we see the shortfall that's going to occur before we can bring in LNG supplies. What do we need to do in order to incentivize additional production to fill that gap that the RCA is now defined? If at the end of that, there isn't enough legislative authority to solve the problem, then they ought to go, those two agencies ought to go to the legislature and say, look, here's the problem. The RCA's done its job. We've defined what the problem is. We've defined the scope of the shortfall. DNR's tried to address on its side has tried to address the shortfall through the through the statutory authority it already has. And we can't get there. We can't close that gap because legislation, we don't have the legislative authority to do X. Legislature, would you please prescribe the legislative authority to do X so we can finish closing that gap? But we're not doing that. We're doing it backwards. We're doing the cart before the horse. The legislature is saying, we're going to do this. And, and, and we think it'll solve the problem without the RCA first defining the problem, doing its, its statutory job of defining problem, and without DNR first stepping up and, 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 and using its existing authorities to try to, to, try to solve the problem right. the RCA defines. And you're exactly right. What that leads to, just like in the early 20 teens, what that leads to is a very expensive solution, subsidies that far outreach, you know, the, 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 the scope of the problem that, that's necessary to solve the problem, and they don't solve the problem on top of it. We ought to take this. We, we've got a statutory setup that does this. Alaska has been foresight, has enough foresight to set up the statutory authority to do this, to set up the agencies to do this. We ought to allow them to do their job, tell them to do their job. You know, one, one thing I told House Resources when I testified before them a couple, a couple of weeks ago was, I'm shocked you haven't called the RCA in here to have to to put the RCA on the carpet and say, what are you doing about defining this problem? It's your statutory obligation to get it defined. What are you doing about defining the problem? They haven't done that. I mean, they just right. sort of left left to a conclusion without letting the agencies that have been set up uh, address the problem. Well, this reminds me of the old Patton quote that basically, where he looked at somebody and said, "Decision making is easy once you have all the facts." It feels like we're not getting all the facts and running, you know, and checking all the boxes before we run to the end of the conclusion and say, oh, we've got to give them money no matter what. And again, once that issue is politicized and it has become a very political issue um, now, you know, and and it starts to raise my eyebrows at some point. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, theorist that says, well, there is no I mean, is there really a shortage? But until they've actually outlined it and laid it all out and given us, you know, metrics and had the RCA look at it, and DNR look at it, you got to be like, well, are they just crying wolf to get more royal? Are they just to get more relief, to get more government money? They saw what happened before. I mean, God, we spent a billion dollars almost in tax credits on this stuff in the past and received very little in return. So you know, at some point you got to be asking like, well, it, it, they're all protesting, uh, you know, and, 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 and talking about it, but where is the, where are the organizations and the departments that have put in, put in place specifically to address it, to lay it out, to give us the metrics and to make those decisions? Where is that information? Now you brought this up to the, to the committee. Was there any further discussion on it after you said, where's the RCA? Where's the DNR? I mean, did, n nobody talks about this. Well, I, I haven't. I haven't. I don't know. I mean, the, the committee. The committee is made up of members. Members talks amongst talks talk amongst themselves, and they and they may have had had this discussion. There's an RCA hearing this week that that I'm been asked to provide public comment at comment at, and I'm going to say the same thing that that look, you have an obligation to step up and help define the problem. You step up and define the problem. You can't have you really can't have a, a, a utility executive out there crying wolf and not have the RCA, which has the statutory obligation to regulate that utility, the, the RCA step up and say, what the heck is going on? Give, right. us, the, give us the facts. Give us and, and, and let's have a hearing to define what's going on and to define what their what their solutions are. Right. We had I mean, this is this is a replay of the of the gas shortage 
in the lower 48 in the 1970s. Right. And there, the, the regulatory commission at the time, the Federal Power Commission, as it was called, ultimately became the FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Federal Power Commission stepped up and started having hearings. Pipeline by pipeline. What's your situation? What, what, what's your shortfall? What, what's the problem? How are we going to address this? Right. And ultimately went to Congress and said, look, we need to let the market decide. We need to have market market forces decide what the what the what the value of gas is. We had the deregulatory act in 1978 and all of a sudden the problem was solved. But we had we had we went through the process. Right. We, did, we didn't say well, we didn't say Congress throw a bunch of money at it. We went through the process of defining what the problem was. Uh, Rob Myers actually says, I think he may say the quiet part out loud. He says the state has spent 50 years fixing problems with subsidies. It's lost the ability to think about any other ways to fix problems, which I think is really a true issue. I mean, he's not wrong. Although there is some good news. Representative Tom McKay says um, we are looking into the RCA and we'll schedule them to report to us and that we are not looking at the tax credit program from the past. So those are good. Those are good. Uh, those are good uh, moves. Right? And I'm happy to see it. But this should have been the first thing, I guess, is I'm in agreement with you, Brad. This should have been the first thing. Tom also says that NSTAR is reporting to Senate resources this week. So good. I mean, that's that's good. We should be asking them questions about that kind of stuff. But uh, but but again, I would say that's getting the cart before the horse. The the RCA is the frontline agency that the statutes have set up to to look at these issues, to govern these issues, to be responsible for these issues. And, and if NSTAR is out there pleading that, that they don't have enough gas, it ought to be the RCA that's stepping up. And it's important from this standpoint. It, it's important from the standpoint of defining the problem. I, I, think, I think a lot of us are thinking, well, or a lot of people are thinking, well, we just don't have enough production coming from the Cook Inlet gas. We're just gonna subsidize them. And I'll explain why it's a subsidy in a moment. We're going to subsidize them with a, with with a lot more a lot more subsidies, and and they're going to go out and develop a lot more gas, and that'll solve the problem. Well, the the problem the problem may be much narrower than that. It may be just a couple of years or three years that we have an issue before we can get before we can get LNG into the into the into the Cook Inlet, which is the which is the ultimate solution. It may be just a couple three years. And, and you don't need to give, you know, huge, huge royalty relief to just get a couple of three years production. DNR can figure out if, 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 the, if the RCA defines it as a couple of years production, DNR should be able to figure out what it takes to get that couple of years of additional production out. And DNR has the authority to do it. What, what we're doing is we're, is we're I, what I'm concerned about that we're doing is we're running to one side of the ship and saying we need to give a lot of relief without really having to find the problem. And it's the RCA, not NSTAR. I mean, NSTAR is, gonna, NSTAR is gonna go out there and claim whatever they think is needed to get a low price, right? They, their, their whole incentive is to get a low price for their gas. And they're gonna go out and claim whatever they need. The RCA is the one with the responsibility for the oversight of both the price and the supply. And, 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 and to have NSTAR testifying, I don't think, NSTAR will be testifying in front of the RCA. The RCA ought to be testifying in front of the legislature. That's that's where we're going wrong. What one other thing on the subsidies? Royalty relief is a subsidy. What essentially what essentially you're doing with royalty relief is you're saying, well, the price ought to be twelve dollars, but NSTAR doesn't want to pay twelve dollars, and so we're going to give we're going to give the producers royalty relief so they can sell the gas to to, to NSTAR at ten dollars. And they don't have to pay the additional two dollars in, in royalty to the in royalty to the state. The state's foregoing that two dollars in order to enable the producers to sell it at sell what they otherwise, what the market otherwise would tell them takes twelve dollars to sell it in ten dollars. And the states the states the one that's that's giving up that giving up that difference. Essentially, the producers are getting two two pots of money. They're getting some from NSTAR in terms of the purchase price, and they're getting some from the state in terms of royalty relief. So. We, we are talking, we're not talking about cash out, but we're talking about not getting cash in that we would, that we would get under, under royalties, uh, foregoing that cash in. And that is as much a subsidy as putting cash out. Tom McKay made a comment, um, which I would like Brad to respond to. 
He says, Cook Inlet uh, is a very mature, remote, isolated oil and gas basin with a very limited market, very different from Brad's experience in the lower 48. So because it doesn't match your experience in the lower 48, Brad, how do you answer that? When do you say this is not your normal, you know, I guess your expertise as an oil and gas expert is being called into question here because this is a different field. Cook, so, Cook, Cook, Cook Inlet is connectable to the lower 48 through LNG. I mean, Cook Inlet becomes the same experience as the lower 48 as a result of imported LNG. We bring in supplies from, from additional sources of supply in order to, in order, in order to meet the demand. It, it, it is, it is a mature field. It is, it is, it is, has been the single source of supply for South Central. That's part of the problem. It's the single source of supply for South Central. And so it's sort of been able to demand things. Um, uh, the producers have been able to articulate, have been able to demand things that, that doesn't occur elsewhere because you've got additional sources of supply. Once we bring in, and we should, once we bring in LNG, the ability to bring in LNG into uh, South Central, we have the same situation as in the lower 48. You've got additional supply sources that can come in. Tom follows up to say, all predictions I've seen showed imported LNG to be much more expensive than what? But much more expensive than producing our own gas, developing and drilling, bringing a pipeline down from the North Slope? I mean, compared to what? I mean, it's the least, most expensive option that we have, I think, is to put to put too fine a point on it. Well, much more expensive than current supplies. But but what what Tom is 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 not articulating or Tom's not looking at is the is the analysis that said to develop additional supplies out of the Cook Inlet it will take price levels that are much higher than current price levels and indeed much higher than imported LNG, that we can bring in supplies of imported LNG at a much lower price point than, than additional Cook Inlet supplies. And my concern is that we, will, that we will continue to say, oh no, it needs to come from the Cook Inlet and pour more and more and more subsidies, either in the forms of royalty relief or other, other things in order to keep the Cook Inlet price down. We don't need to be doing that. There are alternative support su sources of supply, such as LNG, that are much less expensive than the price than the price levels we're going to have to get to to extract those additional Cook Inlet supplies. So it's not it's it, it, this argument isn't about what the current Cook Inlet price is compared to LNG. the The argument is about what is it going to take to bring well, in additional supplies to meet the to meet the long-term supply obligations. The long-term, that's the point. The long-term supply, I mean, how long do we have to subsidize it? But how long does he have, you know, how long do we have to subsidize the bill to keep them down low to their current level? And how much does that cost and who pays that? We're paying it and we're technically, we will be paying higher bills. We just won't see it because it'll be taken in the form of some other tax that we just don't see and we don't connect it to our electric bills. Tom says Brad's technically correct, but does not have constituents who pay power <laughs> bills. Well, sure. But again, the constituents will pay the lower power bill, but get get dicked in the, you know, in the in the back over here because they are getting money taken out somewhere else. I mean, that's the problem. That that's Venezuela. I mean, I, I I with all due respect, Tom, that's Venezuela. We want to keep the we want to keep the gasoline bills down, so we're going to use government money or we're going to use other money to keep to keep gasoline bills down. The question is, who's paying that other money? In Alaska, it's PFD cuts. We're taking money out of middle and lower income Alaska families in order to subsidize South Central gas consumers, and right. that's and that's a problem. I mean, that's you yeah. can see what it's done to Venezuela. You can. If we're trying to always subsidize our way down to lower prices, if we're if we're if we're gonna just ignore the market and say we're gonna continue subsidizing forever uh, in order to keep these prices down, then then somebody's gonna be paying and somebody's gonna be paying more and more and more and more, and it's gonna come in the uh, in in the form of in the form of lost uh, uh, PFDs. I've only got thirty seconds. We can't even respond. Okay, I can't even respond because. <clears throat> We did this in the hearing, Tom. I mean, it's in the, it's in the hearing. Anybody who wants to know the answer to these questions, it's in the hearing record. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. All right, I'm getting I'm getting dialed up now for the <clears throat> number three um, of the weekly top three because um, you immediately heard when the veto couldn't be overridden, you started to see a lot of lamentation from everybody about 
this governor has too much power. He's got too much power and he just, he can't tell us what to do. This, I mean, this really, this is what it sounds like in the Senate side. He can't tell us what to do, which is exactly what it feels like they're saying to the House. You can't tell us what to do. We know best. I mean, they have a pandemic going on in the Senate of we know better than you is what's going on right now. Um, but it's, uh, th- this is, am, am I, am I wrong on the tone that's striking this whole conversation there? Oh no, I oh, know the Senate's being a bully. I mean, the Senate, the Senate is trying to be the governor. They're trying to be the governor in the, in the uni uni legislature. I mean, they want to, they want to tell everybody what to do. They aren't, they aren't a participatory body. They, they've become the bully body, uh, and, and trying to, trying to control the, the entire agenda. And as we will discuss in the next segment, they have there's a statutory not statutory they, they they have they have constitutionally too much power that's enabling them to be the bully uh in in how they do this there may be i mean they may have a point or they may not have a point about whether the governor has too much power in certain respects but it's very clear the legislature has too much power um uh, in uh, in certain respects uh and and enables the senate to set up to be the bully in all this well, this is the effect of uh, leadership and the gold guard being able to hold all that, to glom all that power into themselves and be, you've got half a dozen people in a 60 person legislature basically running the whole show, which is what we've been boning about this whole time, right? Not, not only running the whole show, running the whole state. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and getting pissed when you tell them you think they're wrong. That's the other part. Not not only just running the whole, not being benevolent dictators, but just dictators. That's what it's all comes down to. Here's Michael Dukes and the show. Yeah. The Senate seems to see the House as an advisory committee and the governor as a mere stumbling block and impediment uh, to their rise for full dominance and future in the state of Alaska. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, uh, hit me with this, uh, hit me with this, brother. We are at the point of the Senate now saying they need to have a lower veto override threshold because reasons because they know better than anybody else, right? Give me your thoughts on this, Brad. Well, this is this this particular Senate resolution is a proposed constitutional amendment that would lower the threshold for the th- veto threshold or the up the legislative threshold for upholding a veto uh, on on budget matters from appropriations matters from the three quarters that the Constitution sets it at to the two to two thirds, which would be the equivalent of the uh, of the, the the veto level. Uh, for uh, for regular um, regular overrides, and and what this what this particularly pertains to is the vetoes, the line item vetoes that the governor has has made, uh, this governor has made in the past that have been upheld by the legislature, uh, by uh, as a result of the uh, three quarters provision when some feel that the legislature might have been over able to override those gov- those gubernatorial vetoes vetoes. If the if the standard was only was only two thirds, um, but but that's I mean that's that's the legislature's view. We want more power. We want to have a lower threshold for overriding vetoes uh, because we think we know best. And when the governor vetoes something, we want to be able to override him uh, easier than the three quarters provision provides. Here's here's what that entire discussion is is missing, and and what I believe is a is the constitutional problem with Alaska right now. Let's take the PFD as an example. It's the best example. It's the one that's most on people's minds. But the PF, the PFD was passed, is a statute that was passed by a majority of the legislature, signed by the governor at the time, and that's not been changed. The statute's not been changed ever since. It's still the statute on the books. It's still what the law is. The legislature has not mustered, even the legislature has not mustered a majority for changing the PFD, much less gotten the governor to agree. So you have a you have a, a statutory provision that was signed by the governor at the time that's not been overturned that prescri- that prescribes how uh, how money uh, should be spent. The remedy for that, if you don't like it, is to change the statute, muster a majority. The remedy in other states, if you don't like it, is to change the statute. Muster a, muster a majority, 
of the legislature to change the statute and get the governor to sign it. Or if the governor doesn't sign, doesn't sign it, override, override the veto. If the governor rejects it by vetoing it, override the veto by uh, two thirds of, of the body in other states, two thirds of the body uh, and, and reset the statute. That's not what goes on in Alaska. Here's what, you, what goes on in Alaska is this. They, the, the, the legislature, even with the statute out there, even with it previously been signed by the governor, even without an amendment of it, what happens in Alaska is the legislature can effectively line item the veto, line item veto the appropriation by setting a, a, a lower amount. There's no ability for the governor to reset the amount higher if the legislature sets it a lower, lower amount. And the, and the legislature can do that by majority vote. They are essentially violating a previous statute, essentially overturning a previous governor's decision by, by majority vote, by setting the appropriation for the PFD or whatever, whatever statutory appropriation you've got, statutory appropriation mechanism you've got. They're, they're essentially overturning it by majority vote. If, if, they, if, if the governor vetoed it, line item vetoed, the legislature would have to muster a two-thirds vote to overturn what the governor's done. But they're able to overturn statutory pre pre decisions of previous legislatures, to division decisions of previous governors. They're able to overturn it by a simple majority vote. That gives the legislature a huge amount of power. They can, they can essentially say, we are not going to appropriate uh, by majority vote, they can say we're not going to appropriate, even though the statute provides it, even though a previous governor signed it, even though subsequent legislatures have not been able to amend it, they're able to override a statute by simple majority vote. And the governor has no ability to come back in and say, wait, like the, unlike the legislature, where if the governor line, line items and appropriation, the legislature can come back in and by two thirds vote say, no, we're going to go ahead with or three quarters vote. We, we're going to go ahead with uh, with that appropriation. The governor has no appeal rights when the legislature line item vetoes a statute, a previous statutory provision, line item vetoes it by majority vote. The governor can't say, but wait, this is what the statute says. I want to enforce the statute, make this appropriation. You know, you could, you could set it up where that could happen with a two thirds legislature vote, just like the legislature can override the governor with a two-thirds vote. If the governor appeals something, the legislature has to override a previous statute, override the governor with a two-thirds vote. But that's not what's going on. We're giving the legislature, the, the Constitution is interpreted, gives the legislature the power of line item veto with a simple majority vote. And, and that's and the legislature is using that to bully the process by saying, no, we're not going to live up to the statutory obligation we have. We're not going to live up to what, to what previous governors done have, have, have signed. We're, we know we don't have enough votes to change it, but we're just going to line item veto it. And governor, you have no power to do anything about that. And so we're going to, we're going to take your, and, and, and this goes, this goes for all of the governor's priorities. We're going to take your priority and we're just going to cap it through our power of, of, of majority vote on the appropriation, and you have no power to appeal that. We have the power to appeal you by overriding your vetoes. You have no power to appeal us, even when it involves a statute. And, and so if we're going to start fixing the imbalance of power that some believe exists in the state, then that's another place. That's a place we need to fix it also. The legislature's power to override previous legislatures to override previous governors uh, to override their inability to, to fix a statute, to change a statute, override all of that by simple majority vote. If we're going to start change, if we're going to start rebalancing the power between, between the bodies, that's a place uh, that we need to do it as well. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. We're down to the last uh, couple minutes here, Brad. Uh, so uh, just a, you know, uh, I guess a summation here and maybe a quick question uh, on your thoughts here. Well, I, I, I think that, that, that the legislature really needs to, the Senate in particular needs to stop bullying the other, the other two bodies. The Senate needs to start living up to its, to, to its responsibility as a collegial body to work with other bodies in government, both the 
uh, House and the and the and the governor. And I think I think one way of forcing them to do that, if we're going to start messing with the Constitution, one way of forcing them to do that is to put in the Constitution that we shall the legislature has the obligation to live up to statutes. The governor might veto it. The legislature might override it if if, if by two thirds vote. But but the legislature has the obligation to live up it, until they have the votes to change a statute, until they have a votes to change a statutory appropriation. The legislature has the obligation to live up to a statute that would make them the equivalent of bodies in other states. What we've done in Alaska is given the legislature and indeed one branch of the legislature, uh, because it takes both bodies to appropriate. If one body refuses to appropriate, then that shuts the process down. We've given we've given one body in the legislature too right. much authority. Well, this is what happens when you think you're the smartest person in the room, regardless of the uh, regardless of the of the proof to the contrary. You believe you're the smartest person in the room, so you need to make all the decisions, which I think is what's happening with the Senate right now. And finally, let me get to <clears throat> Marcus's question, and I ask him to clarify. I don't know if this is a typo or not, but he says, "Brad, what's the number one thing we can do to?" Unfluence politicians. I'm not sure he's saying uninfluence them or influence them, but what's the number one thing we can do to have, uh, I guess, our voice be heard is what he's asking. You know, I, I, my, I, I go to, I, I articulate different things. Part of the problem here is the unlimited, is the, is campaign finance issues that politicians can finance their campaigns off of one or two uh, contributors. Um, they don't have to go out and get a broad, uh, a broad base of support from a number of contributors, because Alaska has no, as at a state level, Alaska has no campaign finance con contributions. They can go out and get all the money they need from one or two con contributors, and I think that's part. I think that's part of the problem because then they only have to listen to that certain select group of contributors. There's no. I mean, in the lower 48, you find small money being having a big influence in campaigns. Um, you don't find that here because of the unlimited campaign finance. So if I was going to say there's one thing that 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 could have a long term impact on, on correcting the situation, it would be make politicians lower the campaign, significantly lower the campaign contribution levels to make politicians go out and have to get a broad base of support to finance their campaigns limit, reduce their ability, take away their ability to finance the campaigns from one or two or just a select group uh, of they donors. Need to get, they need to get more of a consensus at that point from a variety of donors. Yep. I mean, that makes sense. Uh, Brad, thank you, my friend. I could keep you on for another 20 minutes already on this. <laughs> All right. Thank you for being part of it today. We appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.